TOA community, welcome back to the channel, everybody. Robert Linkle, trainingtheolderadult.com, and we're here to talk to you today about support sticks and how we utilize our support sticks in-house with our clients, how we are building programming with these support sticks to help bridge the gap for our clients when they either split squat, when they step up, when they squat, uh, when they belt squat, when they do all these different movement patterns. So I'm going to give you a little uh, progressive checklist, if you will, and give you some ideas on how to perform these. And granted, these aren't all of the ways that we use them, but they are a couple. And in case you're like, what are you talking about, support sticks? We're literally talking about like an REI hiking stick, okay? Uh, you don't want the little spiky things at the bottom because they'll stab and poke holes in your gym. Uh, but all these hiking sticks, when you buy them, they come with a little screw-on type thing at the end that um, you would put on for snow, like when you, you know, move around in the snow with a cross-country skiing, that kind of thing. And along with that, in that same bag comes a little rubber tip, and you can just pop that on over the uh, little spike at the bottom, and then you're good to go. We utilize these in-house daily. I have a regular hiking stick, as you're gonna see, like a wood hiking stick that we use with our clients, and then we use these guys. The reason I like these ones best is because you can adjust the height of them to whatever you want. Now, some hiking sticks, you could get two of them like this for $30, okay? And then there are other ones that are $200. What are the difference? I'm assuming there's some kind of, this one's titanium and this one's aluminum and this one's made out of panda and this one's made out of alligator. I, I don't know, I don't know, I'm kidding. I have no idea what the difference in that big of a price jump is. For what we do, the $30 ones work just fine. Uh, I use mine from when I was in, you know, climbing mountaineering with, in, on Shasta and Rainier. And I wanna say mine were like $89, something like that. Uh, we use them on the regular, as you will see in this video. Okay, so checklist and how we perform this. The first one that we like to introduce and teach our clients how to, how to use these support sticks or with a kickstand, okay? Now, always the best way to teach this is gonna be utilizing both sticks, one in each hand. But when you do go to a single, we always wanna go to contralateral first and then ipsilateral second, and I'll explain that and, and why. Now, the question comes first, why are we using the support stick, okay? So I have a client that wants to learn how to do a kickstand or a step up or a split squat. But every time we try to do that, they just continue to lose their balance and kind of tip over. So they are, as we say at the very top up here, right, right, right there, they are, they are unstable, in instability. <laughs> they are, <laughs> they have, they have instability, okay, of their abilities. They are instable. Is that instable or should that be unstability? No, that's instability. Yeah. They have instability. If we just let them hold onto the wall or grab onto the squat rack, well, now they have stability. There's, there's no play in between those. You either are stable or you're not stable. I'm holding onto the squat rack or the wall or the countertop. I'm not holding onto it. So where is there a middle ground? Like how do we get better at this? Okay. So we started using bands. From a high anchor, we grab onto the band and we would try to do some of these movements. Now the bands give you more support the deeper you get into a range of motion and they give you less support the higher you come out of the range of motion. So that became a good tool to help us in our ability to perform split squats and step ups, those kinds of things. Bands are great. But I also wanted something that was just a consistent help across the board and maybe didn't give so much help at the bottom and then not enough help at the top. So as we continued to kind of play with this, we found, well, if I could hang on to something that was like putting my hands on the countertop, but then the countertop moved, okay, well now I'm getting the best of both worlds. Now I'm getting stability, but I'm also unstable enough to where if I don't control that item, I could still fall over. So this is where the sticks came in. When you have one in each hand, you're pretty damn stable. Let's call that 80% stable as opposed to just putting my hands on the wall and now I'm 100% stable. So let's say a stick in each hand is 80. Let's say a contralateral stick is 60. And then let's say an ipsilateral stick is 40. Let's call it something like that. Those aren't real numbers. I'm just kind of giving you some ideas of how you can ladder this all the way back and how we can take a client who 
isn't quite capable of doing a split squat. Put their foot back, have them hold a stick in each hand and go up and down. Okay, I'm getting the hang of that. Well, if my right leg is back, let me get rid of the left stick. Now I'm contralaterally supported. Right foot back, right hand has the stick. I can do that. Let me put it in my left hand now. Now I'm ipsilaterally supported. I can fall to this open side. Not as stable Well, I'm about 40% supported. I can do that. Maybe I just lift the stick up a little bit and I try to split squat and then right at the bottom, I can just touch the stick down for a little bit of balance and then come back up. Well, now I'm about 20% supported. And then eventually I just don't use the stick at all. Okay. That's our goal in this is the stick will give support as needed, but I still have to support the stick. I still have to balance the stick. I still have to do some work. It's not just hands on the countertop, hands on the wall. Well, now all of my balance, stability, coordination, all of that goes out the window because the wall isn't moving. The countertop isn't moving. I can just be still. And some days, we, we do perform lifts and I don't want to worry about stability. I don't want to focus on balance. Grab onto the countertop, do the heaviest single leg RDL you can. Grab onto the countertop, give me the heaviest suitcase style split squat you can. We're not worried about stability, but that's on rare occasion. The majority of the time we are doing this where we're focused on balance, coordination, stability to be able to apply to real life movement patterns for our clients. So that'll start with the kickstand deadlift. One foot propped behind, we hinge and re-return. Start with both, go to contralateral, go to ipsilateral. Then we go to a single leg RDL where your rear leg is completely off the floor. Start with both, go to contralateral, go to ipsilateral, go with none. Then we go to a single leg step up. Okay, I'm going to show you videos of all these. Single leg step ups, both sticks, contralateral support, ipsilateral support, and then maybe do that all over again with alternating feet, up switch, up switch, up switch, right? And then you use two and then just use one and every step that you take, that's going to alternate contra ipsa, contra ipsa as you go anyhow. So you don't even need to switch hands. You'll switch stabilities while you're doing the step ups, which is even cooler because if I put a weight in my hand while I do these, well now I'm building more strength needed. I'm actually tearing and building more muscle fiber than I need to perform these lifts, but I have a stick support to help me in my range of motion. So I can produce overload while having some extra support. I can get really strong doing this. And then eventually maybe instead of using a 30 pound dumbbell, I only use a 10, but I don't need the stick anymore. I can just support myself with a little external load. These are all wins. These are all going in the right direction. Okay. So there's our alternating step ups. Then we go to split squats, two sticks, contra, ipsa, and then we either forward step lunge, difficult, drop step lunge, maybe less difficult. I find clients have a harder time doing a forward step push off because you are taking a little bit shorter of a step going forward. And when you push back, they want to lead with their head and their shoulders, not with their hips. Learning to drop step into the lunge teaches you to lower your hips, lead with your tailbone, kind of displace your body weight down and back and then step up and forward, which is more practical as about 70% of the falls that we experience in life happen in that direction behind us, okay? Doesn't mean that we're not gonna fall forward, but about 30% of the time, on average, we do forward stepping lunges in our programming because about 30% of the time, we fall forward in real life, all right? Okay, let's take a look at a couple of these. Now, as we're going through this here, this starts with the belt squat, and Linda's up on here, and, and uh, I've got, um, uh, Cooper up on here rehabilitating both with knee injuries, right? For both, both of these, Linda pending knee replacement, Cooper recovering from a massive knee injury, both of them benefited greatly from the belt squat, but needed some support. So they started with the sticks to help them establish the depth, help them get deep, help them control their postures. And then as they started to progress and get stronger, we started to move to one stick holding in the middle with both hands and then eventually just no stick at all. Cooper in a week was able to do that on his own. Okay, here are some forward stepping lunges and you can see and some of our clients are doing gate steps while others are doing full lunge steps. It just kind of depends on the client. They even have load for those that are using sticks like Joan, okay? She has a load, but she's trying and attempting to do a bit of a flexed knee gate step. 
here we are and she's next to the counter and wants to use that counter. I give her the stick instead so she can practice this forward step push off, forward step push off. We're practicing bigger gait steps, building her confidence, okay? Here's Elaine performing a contralateral drop step lunge. Look how comfortable she is. The contralateral leg, the left leg, very supported. Oh, we go to ipsilateral, a little bit harder, okay? A little harder, not as confident. She fell a little bit on that one, right? You can see that she's got to like over shift and kind of counter to that side. It's a little bit more difficult, okay? Here we are with just a traditional split squat. We're going to load that up, okay? Let's look at that one one more time. Load that up. She's got a nine pound uh, power block in her hand there while she's performing these split squats. But this is where I was talking about. She's not really active in that arm until she's right at the bottom and she's changing directions, okay? Here's Frank with our, our client has uh, Parkinson's and you can see as he's kind of drop stepping on this left leg, this is a challenge left leg for him. We're having a hard time establishing the depth, establishing the length of that leg. Okay, here's Joyce holding her right hand, contralateral drop steps. Now we've had people ask, why are we using the ramp on that rear leg? If I can establish confidence stepping backwards, that's great. But if I can't, how do we get there? I give them sticks, okay, and they've got some support, but they're still stepping in the backwards direction Maybe that backwards direction gives this feeling of, I'm falling, I don't know how to lower my hips or my center mass, so why don't I bring the floor up to them a little bit? We've got um, two two by fours that we stack underneath that ramp, which is just a, a two by three foot chunk of, of a butcher block that was supposed to be a countertop in here in the gym, but we realized we had nowhere to put the skier, and so the last three feet of our bench over here got cut off so we could put the skier in there, and the, the contractor was like, well, I'm going to take this block back. And I said, no, hey, man, I already paid for that. You leave that here. We can use that for all kinds of stuff. So for three years now, we've been using that ramp. It's a great piece of wood. We use it for all kinds of stuff, okay? Two inches in height. That's great for step-ups, ramps, all this kind of stuff. So we'll do the same thing here. We'll establish really good confidence moving in that backwards direction by simply giving them a ramp that's about four inches higher. The floor meets their foot in a higher position and they can start to sit down into that drop step. Look at her flexing that back knee. Okay, let's go back to that one here again real quick. Okay, watch, look at that back knee. She doesn't get this range of motion flat floor anywhere. Okay, we're getting a really good, I mean, she's almost to 90 degrees there, pretty close to 90 degrees on that knee. That's That type of drill helps us get to this one, right? Where you see Elaine dropping back. Look at everybody at home. They all have PVC pipes. They all have support sticks, walking sticks, canes. Look at them all practicing their drop steps, getting deep, practicing that back heel, that back ankle being nice and tall and vertical, okay? I love it. This is one of my favorite drills for our clients to do. Even with step ups, this is a eight inch step for Joyce, which is quite challenging. She's got one really strong leg, her non hip replaced leg, and then her other leg really, really struggles. She has to shift and like pop her hip out to the side when she does it. We don't know if her hip was simply um, misaligned when she did her surgery or if it just wasn't rehabbed well because uh, she got that hip replacement well before she, she met me. Now, she just turned 83 and I've been training her for three years and I think she got her hip replacement at like 74, 75. So about five years, I think, uh, if I'm remembering that correctly, since her hip replacement, where she basically, they didn't rehab, they just said, go back to life. And, and so she's learned to compensate around this weak hip. So we're doing everything we can, right, to get that hip really strong again, but she can't perform steps on an eight inch step without some kind of assistance. However, there are eight inch steps in her home. There are eight inch steps in the real world that she is going to you know, be faced with and need to overcome. So where is there a happy medium where I can offer support, we can manage and manipulate that su support with either two, one, or one in either position, contra, ipsilateral setups. And then I can even reduce just the amount of recruitment that I put in my hand when I go down simply by just lightening my grip or literally just by lifting the stick up as I move down. And if I feel like I'm not gonna make it, or if I'm doing a set of 10, and at six or seven, I start to fatigue, and like, I don't know if I'm gonna make it, I just put the stick down, and I continue to use a little bit of upper body assistance. 
Now, the beauty in this is I am the one propelling myself up and down. I'm still doing the range of motion. I am still under my own strength. Even if you go, well, you're cheating, you're using the stick. Yeah, but who's pushing on the stick? I am. So this is a full body lift that I'm now incorporating to help me achieve my, my outcome effort, which is move my knee up and down closer to the floor and get back up from that position. So I'm not going to be judged or graded on that. If I fall down, I just need to get back up. The point is, can we get up and down off the ground? I am going to be under my own power to do that. And it doesn't matter if I put my hand on my knee and push when I go to get up, or if I put my hand on this stick and push when I go to get up. Either way, I've practiced and established and built the strength and the range of motion to achieve this. What is the overall reasoning for this? This will take you all the way back to a study that, I don't know who did the original study, but Mike Boyle was the one that really kind of brought attention to it. When he said, football players, hockey players, basketball players are rarely ever in a bilateral, even loaded position, okay? They're almost always in a contralateral, ipsilateral, side to side, forward and back, sprinting position. So why would we perform a back squat or a deadlift constantly in that position and say, this is going to apply best to sport, okay? And it led to a study where, or a suggestion by Mike Boyle, not the study yet, but it led to a suggestion by Mike Boyle that if you could perform a two parallel squat, okay, you can sit down to parallel and you can stand back up. If you can do that in a chair to parallel, both legs are working, bilateral sit to stand. Does that guarantee that you can put one leg behind you in a split squat, go down to parallel, knee to the floor, and get back up on both legs? No, it doesn't. But if you can do a split stance, down to one knee, split squat, unload on the floor and get back up on both legs, does that guarantee that you can bilaterally squat to a chair, sit down and stand up? Yes, it does, okay? And that brings us to the idea of, if I do leg press, if I do quad extensions, if I do hamstring curls, if I do abductions, if I do adductions, if I do glute extensions, if I do uh, hip swings, if I do all these actions that train my lower half on controlled machines, what will happen? I will get stronger at performing all those machine actions. But those tested before they train on the machines and after to be able to do a lunge, put their knee down on the ground and get back up, showed zero improvement, zero improvement in being able to do the action of lunging. All they did was increase their overall strength on all the machines. This proves to us, and my point is, if you can't do a lunge, if you can't get your knee down to the ground and get back up, you're never gonna learn how to do it. No matter how many machines you train, no matter how strong you get on the leg press, you're at 80 pounds and you can now leg press 300 pounds. You have tripled your strength and your abilities on the leg press, if you haven't practiced splitting a foot, putting your weight down on your knee and getting back up, it doesn't matter how bilaterally strong you are on pushing with both legs. You can't do a lunge. You cannot split your feet. You can't coordinate the movement. So you're not going to get any better at doing that unless we practice it. So how do we practice it? We give you sticks or we give you a band or we give you a contralateral support or we give you an ipsilateral support or we adjust the height in which there's a pad under your knee where you split squat to an eight inch pad, a six inch pad, a four inch pad, a two inch pad, no pad with sticks, with one stick contra, with one stick ipsa, etc. And we build your ability from the top down because where can everybody start? At the top. Where can everybody not get to? At the bottom. So it doesn't make any sense for us to go, well, let's just put them on their knee and try to build their strength from the bottom up. That makes no sense. You need to reverse engineer this and you need to reverse engineer it with support to teach the range of motion. Make them lighter, give them support sticks, make them lighter, give them bands to hang on to and train the range of motion. That action paired with all those machines and sit to stands and squats and all the other shit we just talked about, paired with all that, will ultimately help them perform better lunges because the strength gains are great. The bone density is great. The joint elasticity and the, and the ligament and tendon stability and all that, all great. But are they learning how to, to perform the neuromuscular patterning of getting down to a knee, unloading, and getting back up, which is going to happen if they fall? No, it doesn't. 
So that's why we have to practice this. That's why this style of training is so valuable to this specific population, 50 and over, deconditioned, undertrained, soft bones, soft muscles. You don't have the ability to get back up and down off the ground or you're not quite sure, then you should probably start with some hiking sticks and start reverse engineering your strength to help you get to the ground and get back up again. Because if you fall and no one else is around, are you gonna be able to get back up again? If you can't answer that question, you're in trouble. My name is Robert Lankel. This is trainingtheolderadult.com. If you have any comments, questions, hit me up down below. Happy to help. Make sure you hit that bell, check the little box. Make sure you get uh, notified anytime we put up new content and new information. From all of us here at trainingtheolderadult.com, we love and appreciate you all. And until next time, continue to fight your good fight against sarcopenia. Take care.